right, let's uh, call the uh, Bloomington Historic Preservation Commission Zoom meeting to order for May 28, 2020. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we need approval for the minutes from our last meeting, which was back in April. So moved. Okay, second. Who, okay who made the motion and who seconded? Yes. Jeff made yes. the motion. Motion. Sam seconded. Sam second. Okay. All right. Uh, are, are we going to take a uh, roll? We'll call it. Yes, let's do a roll call. I just called it early. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, Doug Bruce. Sam DeSolar. Present or sort of present. <laughs> Susan Dyer. Here. Jeff Golden. Available. Deb Hutton. Lee Sandweiss. Here. John Saunders. Here. Chris Sturbaum. Duncan Campbell. Here. Ernesto Castaneda. Here. Derek Ritchie. Jenny Southern. Here. Okay. Uh, now for the approval of the minutes. Sam DeSolar. Yes. Susan Dyer. Yes. Jeff Golden. Yes. Lee Sandweiss. Abstain. John Saunders. Yes. Chris Sturbaum. I don't think he's here. He I'm, is here. He might be muted. Let me check. Yeah, I see him down there. Yeah. There you go, Chris. Talk. He's probably muted. I think I'm unmuted now. You're, yeah, you're good. <laughs> yeah, you're unmuted. Good. So, minutes? Approved. Okay. All right. Motion carries, or minutes carry. Uh, five, one, zero. All right, let's uh, move on to COA and staff review, which is COA 20-19. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was a staff approval. It was essentially a, a restoration work done on this, uh, what appears to be a, an original accessory structure to this building here. This is a view from Woodlawn Avenue. Uh, it's in the Elm Heights Historic District. Uh, the majority of the work was restoration and repair, including uh, repair of the siding, uh, new roof, new gutters. Um, they're gonna be putting some trim down at the bottom uh, instead of the, the siding. And they're gonna be replacing uh, these, there's four of these three over one windows. They're going to maintain the same size, uh, style, and paint configuration, and they're also going to be made out of wood. Um, and then one wood, one window that you can't see in this picture, it's on the a gable end over here, will be uh, repaired. Um, so staff approved this work. All right, thank you, Connor. <clears throat> All right, we'll move on to our commission review. Uh, COA 20-20. Uh, we've seen this one before, 325 South Rogers. Uh, about a year ago, we approved uh, uh, changing out some original windows. And um, we're back again now for a fence request. Uh, so this is the Prospect Hill Historic District. Uh, the request is to install a four foot picket fence around the front and sides of the home. Uh, so what you see here in yellow would be the four foot height. And then uh, as it transitions here to the, the rear and the, and the side and the rear of the home, they're going to make it a six foot uh, tall privacy fence. So this is a COA for uh, fencing. Uh, when you look at the guidelines, uh, backyard fences are appropriate in Prospect Hill. Um, however, front yard fencing is characterized as, uh, well, not in the character of the neighborhood. Um, so the staff finds that the wood and the style picket of the front yard fence is appropriate. However, the guidelines specifically mention that front yard fencing is inappropriate. 
um, and discourages its use. Uh, the wooden privacy fence in the backyard is appropriate. However, the style proposed uh, is a horizontal orientation, and I believe the guidelines show pictures of more vertical orientation fences. Um, historically, properties in this district have relied on landscaping uh, and retaining walls to really create that line between uh, public and private space. Um, so fences that utilize traditional styles and materials to conform to the codes, fence height standards, really overall have a minimum in, in, minimal impact on the character of the district and the house itself. You know, fencing, I want the, the commission to keep in mind, doesn't really result in the loss of any architectural features or materials on um, the historic buildings themselves. And they're really an impermanent feature that can be removed in the future. Um, so overall staff would recommend approval of the backyard fence as requested and denial of the front yard fence um, I do want to bring one more thing to light before we begin questions and discussion. Uh, after a conversation with uh, planning yesterday, um, it was determined that the petitioner's request to build a fence, the fence in the front here is actually not uh, on their property. Their property line stops here. So mm -hmm. the petitioner would actually need uh, an encroachment uh, permit or, or whatever to be able to build a front fence here. Um, also, uh, since it's a corner lot, uh, city planning considers both facades along Rogers and Prospect Street as the front of the house. So what this means for fencing is that the max fence height in the in front of the building wall can only be four feet. Um, that's an issue when you get to here because this uh, petitioner has the fence at six feet, and this fence is in front of the front building wall, which is shown by my blue line here, would need to be four feet if this is where it's being built. Now, if the petitioner bumps it back here to where it's behind the front building wall, then it can certainly be six to eight feet tall. Um, however, as it stands, since it's in front, the orange section here um, really, and this is, is not okay uh, from planning standards. So. Uh, Jackie wanted me to convey that to the commission. Um, here's an example of the wood picket. Here's the example of the privacy fence. Okay. All right, let's move on to questions. <clears throat> Duncan? A question so the well, we're doing Duncan first, Chris. Oh, good. I thought so. I just didn't hear anything. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Duncan, yeah. yeah, Duncan. Yeah. Question. Sorry, I had to, I had to uh, leave the room. <laughs> that happens. Well, it, sound, it sounds like, first of all, it doesn't meet the guidelines, which is pretty major. Second of all, it's not in the right place to meet, even to meet planning requirements, which is double major. <laughs> And the backyard fence doesn't appear to be the right style. I don't think that's as important, maybe. But um, I don't know. I've always struggled with this because uh, these neighborhoods were built so that you could walk through them, see through them, and be active through them. And more and more, we've allowed them to privatize their yards to the point where some places you can't even see the houses anymore. So I, I guess I, I more or less support the backyard notion because people want outdoor privacy these days, but um, I don't really, I don't really see a, re a resolution for the front yard fence. Uh, does the owner know about what planning is going to require in terms of where that fence would be located? I don't think the owner has spoken to planning on this. However, uh, we should have some representatives of the owner here to speak on that. We do. Mike, do you have any comments? Uh, hi, everyone. Michael Corris, uh, Realtor with Maxim Real Estate. We have this house listed. Also on the meeting, I see uh, Jamie Morris is the buyer's agent for this particular house. Uh, and I think I also saw that potential buyers are here as well. 
Um, <laughs> what hasn't been read from our petition is that uh, potential buyers uh, have a newborn uh, and also a dog. And one cool thing, if you look at the front of this house, is that it has an awesome front porch, which these potential buyers would love to use without the worry of their child or dog running out into either of those streets that border this house. So we actually have an offer that is contingent upon some sort of fencing um, that allows them to be able to use that front porch and enjoy it. Uh, the other thing, that picture, I mean, it was just, I, I believe Jamie, who's on this call, I, I think it was a, just a, a sketch. We have, they didn't meet with planning. It was just a sketch. So they're not going to build a fence on the city property. Um, so they, they, whatever setbacks that are required there is what they would do. But the biggest thing on that front fence and, uh, one, they wanted it to be picket so it wouldn't cover up the house at all. I don't think they would probably mind if that back uh, portion of the house, uh, that backyard fence on Prospect um, were shorter or continued to be the picket. Um, but they're, they're on the phone and it, it truly is was their design and, you know, I don't think they're set on they're set on working with you guys to to come up with a solution that that works and allows them to buy this house. Okay. If if we don't if we don't get something, I guess I'll go attempt to sell the house again. Thank you, Michael. Um, Ernesto? But Jamie Jamie um, is on this call and and she's okay. the one that kind of helped uh, with okay. pictures and drawings and stuff like that. We'll get to her in a minute, Michael. Thank you. Uh, Ernesto, do you have some yes. questions? Yes. Um, not necessarily questions, but I do agree with Duncan's uh, assessment of the situation on, on the fence. These houses were designed to be much more transparent. Times are different now. So I wouldn't be opposed to have something in the back of the house for privacy and, you know, safety of you know, dogs and kids. That's all I have. Thank you, Ernesto. Jane? You're welcome. Um, well, I don't think planning is saying they can't have fencing in the back of the house. Matter of fact, I believe the fencing height is raised maybe even to eight feet. I'm not sure if that's appropriate historically. It's just the style of the backyard fence that I think was being objected to because it's horizontal, which is a very modern 60s, 70s vibe for this particular house. Um, the picket fence also, it seemed to me, is too tall in the front yard. I'm not sure I've ever seen a four foot picket fence. I've seen three feet. Four feet's like chest high, right? That's how tall you are. Yeah, so it, it's, it's very tall. Um, and also it's possible if they really wanna use the front porch that uh, they could ask for a little gate on the porch itself so that they can go out there, I don't know that can be removable after the child's all old enough not to run out into the street. Um, I think I've seen little gates on houses of this sort, um, so it might not be a big deal between the two entry posts. But that's it. Thank you, Jenny. Chris? I agree with staff about the front fence, and I think the fence on Prospect needs to be shorter and transparent. Uh, I, you really can't see the rest of it, and they can certainly enclose the side and the back and have good use for their dog. And they sell all kinds of special gates that would work and wouldn't even need approval. I think they're, they're child gates that they could put on their, on their front porch and keep the child safe. That's a question? I, Did you hear? Oh, was that your question, Chris? Are you Actually, able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, I guess I commented, didn't I? Yeah. I did too. Sorry about that. It's okay. That's, I have no questions. I have a comment. Okay, great. Uh, Lee, do you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions. Thanks. And Sam, do you have any questions? 
No questions, comments for sure, but no questions. Okay, perfect. And I don't have any questions. So, hey, Jeff. Oh, Jeff, I'm sorry. I missed you. That's okay. I don't have any questions. Right, thank you. Okay, we'll move to comments now. Uh, Duncan, do you have any comments? Um, I think I already made my comment. Okay. And Ernesto, any comments? No. No, no comments. Thank you. And Jenny, any comments? I think I made mine too. Sorry about that, guys. It's okay. It happens. Um, Chris? Um, I think the horizontal uh, fence in the back is okay. I really think, though, where you see it from prospect, it should be, uh, it should be that picket style. Hopefully painted white. Okay. Jeff, comments? No further comments. Lee? Um, I agree with uh, the staff recommendations. I, I do also uh, agree with, well, I like the possibility of exploring a kind of a, a fence for that front porch to keep the child safe and the dog safe, if that's possible to add that. And, um, Cause that's a beautiful porch and it'd be a shame for them not to be able to enjoy it. And a, a, a discreet gate would allow that. Um, and so that's it. Okay, thank you, Lee. And Sam, how about your comments? Um, let's see. Uh, so I read through the guidelines and um, what they're asking for on fencing. Uh, I would support fencing that was, I mean, it's a corner lot. So both facades on each street front are considered front facades. So you've got to move the front fence back to the halfway point of hey, Connor, would you go to the um, that little diagram with the yeah? There you go. Um, so the uh, the fence along South Rogers has to go back to the middle there about about where his cursor it was um, to the middle of the you know middle of the front facade along the back from South Rogers also to the middle of the facade on the West Prospect, which is almost to the edge of the back of the garage. Um, so you're basically, your fencing can only enclose sort of the back quarter, the sort of northeast corner of the yard. So along the alley and along the north face of the lot, I don't have a problem with a high fence. Um, the way I read the guidelines, they don't want any horizontal fencing. So I am thinking that that fencing, regardless of what it is, has to be some kind of vertical picketish fencing, although you could do a vertical board fencing. Um, and it should be shorter on the halfway points. Um, I don't think that you, I, I support the previous comments that you could work with some kind of temporary gate uh, on the porch, um, but I would be opposed to a, a sort of a horizontal fencing along the back, having read the guidelines, and a high fencing at the halfway points. Per the guidelines and per planning, the sort of uh, sweet spot is you got to have a low fence at the midpoints and a high fence at the back things, but they all got to be vertical. That's what I got. All right, thank you, Sam. Um, are the petitioners with us? Um, Jeff, a comment. Or Jeff, oh, Jeff did. He didn't have any comments. Okay. I believe. Jeff, did you have any more comments? I don't. Okay. Hey, guys, yeah. I haven't had a chance to comment yet. It's Susan. I'm sorry, Susan. I'm um, <laughs> that's okay. I just had a quick question. Connor, it looks like along Rogers Street, the property line is right along the front of the house anyway. 
Yeah, that, that's what we determined with planning. So uh, they couldn't build that fence where the yellow line indicates. However, I believe Michael just kind of said, this was just a rough drawing. They would build yeah. the line where they need to. So it would just run. I mean, even if, if everyone approved it, it would have to just run. Where that blue line is. Yeah, which is along the front of the house. So they wouldn't really have a front yard. Be aware that the GIS in. is not exact. OK. Fair enough. Um, I think Sam summed it up really nicely. So that's it. So Jeff, I just want to follow up on what you said. You said the GIS is not exact, and that's true, but this is what they use in planning. So, you know, it, it'd be up to the owner to show that the property line actually runs here to the sidewalk before the city would allow that fence to be built there. Absolutely. But oh, I'm guessing that the, the property line is not at the front of the house. Yeah, it might be, be just a few feet unusual. off. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, is the petitioner with us? Jamie, are you here? Yes, I'm here. This is Jamie Morris from Century 21 Sheets. I'm representing the buyers who have an accepted offer on this property. Um, and I guess, you know, the, I think that the buyer would like to speak in a moment or, or has some comments or questions, but um, I spent quite a bit of time driving all through Prospect Hill and took dozens of photos of homes that have front fences um, and I saw every type of fence from picket fence to aluminum fencing to um, chain link fencing in Prospect Hill. Now the chain link fence looked pretty old, so it may have been existing. Um, before this committee was active. Um, but there's a, a really excellent example at 620 West 4th Street on the corner of Fairview and 4th that has a very similar setup. It's a, a corner lot. It's got the picket fence in the front. It goes all the way out to the sidewalk. Um, buyers, you know, they're flexible with where the fencing can go. They don't want to break any rules or or do any kind of variance with the fencing. It is mostly for safety. The The front porch is very unique in that it has two staircases with, oh, approximately four or five steps coming off on the north side and the south side. And ideally with a pet and a, a child, the thought is if they're enjoying time on the front porch and the dog wants to run to the backyard, it's, it's a fluid transition from the porch to the backyard with a child or if you're out doing yard work or anything like that. Um, uh, it, it is not so much that they want it exactly as it's drawn there and it isn't so much that it has to be horizontal but they do want a little bit of privacy in the back and I'm just curious if if these fences aren't allowed in the front how do the people who have them get them and and maintain them I can answer that question for you Jamie uh, a lot of these fences uh, were built probably before these areas became historic districts, like you alluded to with the chain link fence. Uh, the fence you showed us, or you, you pointed to on uh, West 4th Street, um, is a different historic district. That's Greater Prospect Hill. They have different guidance on fencing. This is Prospect Hill proper historic district, um, which has separate guidelines from Greater Prospect Hill. And you know, we, we, we try our best to follow the guidelines. And in this case, they, they explicitly mention front yard fencing as, as uncharacteristic. So the Prospect Hill Historic District is just this little area, um, you know, maybe a couple streets to the west here Madison. And, and down to Madison. So, so, so it, there were different historic districts to answer your question. With different I would areas. add, that fourth street fence, if, the, if it's the one I'm thinking of, wasn't built to city code or historic code. It's a six foot fence all along. Um, uh, Chris, it's a picket fence. It's, I think it's on the corner of Fourth and Maple or Fourth and Fairview. Fourth and Fairview. Fourth and Fairview. Yeah. I'm just saying that wasn't built to anybody's code. Okay. Did Jamie, any more comments? Uh, I don't have any at this time, but I do think Josh and Abby Kelly, uh, who are the prospective buyers, are on the line. And 
and would like to make comments. Okay, great. We'd like to hear them. Thank you. Uh, hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for uh, allowing us to speak. Um, I'm my wife is with our newborn. She just woke up from a nap. Um, I wish we could uh, introduce him to everybody. But um, first off, I think you know, one of the big things that drew us to this house was the historic nature. Um, I'm from Bloomington. I've lived up in Indy for about 10 years now. I grew up out on the west side in a house that was built um, around 1864. So, you know, having a very good understanding of maintaining the historic character of a home is very important um, to both of us. And that's really why we wanted to find this place as we were looking to come back to Bloomington and raise our family. Um, but with that, I also know that, you know, Rogers is a, is a busy street. Um, there's a lot of activity there, um, whether it's just kind of daily traffic going back and forth um, or, you know, people coming and going from the hospital, whatever it might be. And so, you know, with that, it's just really important. We'd love to be able to use the whole yard um, and try to have some type of barrier that is as unobtrusive as possible um, to try and keep, you know, this one child safe. We hope to grow our family a lot more, um, you know, have a dog, maybe a few dogs, whatever it might be, um, but just be able to have that space and be able to enjoy the whole property um, without kind of restricting um, the ability for people in the community to enjoy the property as well. And so I would say when, whether it comes to height of fence, the exact location, um, I will be having a surveyor come to the property on June 8th to figure out exactly where the corners are um, because that drawing looks like it does conflict with planning a little bit. We certainly don't want to try to do that. Um, hopefully the property line is indeed not running kind of through the front porch there like it looks like. Um, but either way, I think the big thing is, you know, we just want to be as cooperative as possible and try to, um, you know, take feedback from the commission to try to get to something that allows um, both our family to enjoy the property uh, in a way that's consistent with its historic nature and also still allows the community to enjoy that as well. And I think um, that's why the picket fence was selected. Uh, the height, I, I don't know for sure. I'm happy to um, take any feedback on the height and do something that's certainly consistent with the historic um, guidelines. And then the horizontal fencing that was really done with the idea to try to maintain as much, um, you know, visibility as possible so people could still see through it a little bit, um, even though giving us a little bit of privacy in the backyard. So that's really um, the main thing I, I would really, um, you know, ask that um, the commission, I, I really appreciate the points that have been made. They're, they're certainly very fair and we don't want to do anything that, uh, you know, has a negative impact on um, the character of the neighborhood by any means, um, but I would ask if there's any way to try and give feedback, allow us an opportunity to try to set something up here um, that does, you know, let us keep um, the kids safe from going out in the yard uh, and letting them enjoy the whole property and then also balance that with letting the community enjoy the property as well. So thank you again for the time and I hope that clarifies a little bit of where we're coming from. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, I think we need a motion. Unless there's more comments. No, I'm I'm good. Thank you. Okay. So we need a motion. I'd move that we support the staff uh, recommendation with the exception of the lower fence along Prospect. I don't think that's uh, quite clear enough. Um, I can't, I, I, I think that we have to address the midpoint issue of the facade in this motion. Um, and I, I'll be happy to tackle that if um, that's okay. Absolutely. I just um, want to say, uh, sorry, Sam, I, I just want to say it might be a little hard to approve something right now before uh, Mr. Kelly can get the surveyors back and we can really see where the property lines are. I, I, I hear that, but I think that the issue is not necessarily the property lines. I think, uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me try something here. And, and if, uh, if it tricks out, great. If not, we'll wait till the survey comes back. Um, I would move to approve a, uh, a fencing situation where a low fence 
at the midpoint of the facade measured back from both West Prospect and South Rogers uh, in a vertical picket, either between three and four feet. And uh, along the property line of the alley, that is an alley on the backside, and the property line uh, north of Prospect Street um, at, a, at a higher uh, per planning height and, and with vertical uh, either pickets or boards. I think that will, I think that will satisfy both the, uh, the guidelines and planning. And they can put gates wherever they want and they can put gates along uh, tem especially temporary gates along their front porch. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion. Second. All right. <clears throat> who uh, who seconded that? I did. Lee. Uh, Lee. Okay. Lee. Thank you. All right. Okay. I ask a clarifying question. Yes, sure. Chris. Um, I think I understand that. The midpoint we're talking about is a long prospect and that the lower fence is going east along prospect from the midpoint of that facade along Prospect Street. Is that correct? There's two midpoints because it's a corner lot. You have a midpoint of the facade along the north side of the house uh, for the back fence uh, parallel to Rogers. You have the midpoint of the facade on the east side of the house that's gonna be parallel to West Prospect Street. Does that make sense? Um, the midpoint you're talking about is north, on the north side, right? And the south side. Say that again, Chris. Your midpoints are on the north and the south side of the property. No, that's no. not what I'm saying. Because it is a corner lot, oh, you're okay. gonna have a midpoint of the facade on both the north side for the fence that is parallel to South Rogers Street, and you are going to have a midpoint of the facade along the south side of the house for the fence that is parallel to West Prospect Street. There's gonna be some fence that basically runs between the back of the house and the garage, and there's gonna be some low fence that runs between the sort of the north side of the house, midpoint of the north side of the house, and that property along the, uh, uh, the to the north. This is confusing. The, yeah. the facade facing Rogers is the west facade. True. And there, we're not proposing a fence on that facade, as I understand. No, we're proposing a, a fence halfway back of the facade of the house. On the north and south sides. On the north side of the house. The, there's the fence that runs north-south that's parallel to the South Rogers Street, right? That's going to be sort of halfway between, uh, if you measure halfway, you know, halfway down the house. Okay, the north-south is the back of the house. Exactly. Well, no, it's a corner lot, Chris, right? I know what it is. So you're going to have a fence that runs north-south halfway down the house. Uh, to the north of the house, and you're going to have a fence that runs east-west, halfway down the house that runs between, basically, the house and the garage. And those both have to be set back halfway, because both of those facades are basically considered front facades. Right. Sam, you're talking about this, and we're all, I'm on the same page, because I think I know what you're talking about, but where the sidewalk connects to Prospect Street. So we're talking where the, where the bump out is, where the kitchen is. Um, I don't know where the kitchen is. Can, can you, can Connor, can you like move we your can't. cursor? Yeah. Can you, you move the cursor? Me. Okay, so move your cursor to the right a bit, to the midpoint of the east side. No, I'm sorry, the wet, yeah, the east side of the facade. I don't see your cursor. Yeah, so midpoint, midpoint of the east facade. That's the south facade. There you go. Yeah, there. And, and then, so from that point, directly uh, to the garage, to the east, to the garage. That's one fence. That's sort of the midpoint. That's one. That's fence. planning. 
And then if you go sort of midpoint of the facade to the north of the house, there you go, right about there. If you go north from there, that's where the second low fence happens. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so I'm talking about a low fence in those two locations, gates wherever you want, and then from the sort of northeast corner of the property Hello. back to those two points, you can have a high fence. Does that make sense? And my proposal had been to follow that orange dotted line on the prospect side and allow that short fence to be out that close to the street. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that. I, I can't agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need to, we have a motion on the table. Sam made it and we second it. So I think that now we have a clarification on Sam's motion is, I think we need to take a vote on that. And then if nobody agrees, then we can go back and make another motion. Yeah, I think Chris made the motion before that though. It wasn't seconded. Okay. Okay. Uh, Connor has a suggestion that we just table this until the next meeting. And then we allow the petitioner to get their survey done. And then we can get, uh, Sam can put together uh, his proposal and Chris can put together his proposal and we'll just take it up at our next meeting. I don't know that that would affect my proposal at all because where the property lines happen doesn't really affect my proposal. Okay. The problem with your proposal, Sam, is I don't think everyone fully understands it without a visual in front of them. Um, so it'll be a lot easier. I think we know what we were voting on if we had, you know, a visual of where that fence and the heights are going to be on the property. Yeah. Gotcha. Hang on. Let me let me draw something real quick and see if I can make share it. And if we can't, then I, I totally agree with you. Uh, can I, can I hmm, quick, quick suggestion. Quick suggestion. Yes. Um, I think uh, the the problem here is that. Um, Planning has different ideas of where the finch goes, and theirs is actually uh, stricter than what we, what uh, Chris was proposing. Um, we ran into that a couple of times over in our neighborhood, and because it's because of the corner lot, and it actually requires a variance unless the code is changed uh, to bring that even a short fence. Well. You could do a short fence, I think, all the way out to Rogers, but they can't have their stockade fence back there. Um, so even if we said, oh, yeah, do that, it wouldn't be legal because they need a variance from planning. That help at all or make it worse? There's where you have your cursor is where planning would say uh, they could have a fence. Yeah, like, but that it has to be four feet here. Hey, hey Connor? And you have a can short one there, not a tall one, where your cursor was. Connor, yeah, yeah. can you allow me to share? Uh, yes. Let me know when it's shareable. All right, try it now. OK. So <laughs> can you guys see that? Oh. No. Yeah. Let me stop. Let me pause my share. Now you try. Okay. Oh. We see you. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not letting me do what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, technology. You have a little green button at the bottom that says share screen. Oh, yeah. No, I'm on an iPad, and that's the uh, kind of, you know, I got an idea. Give me just a sec. Um, I'll change nope. this to a thing. Hang on. And let me label a couple of things real fast. Why are we seeing Duncan's screen? <laughs> Thank you, Duncan. How are you all there? Oh, that's terrible handwriting. Sorry. Okay. 
<clears throat> I made him a co-host, so he should be able to share. Yeah, he should. Yeah. Just to fill the blank time, if petitioner were to propose something for the next meeting that is in line with the discussions we've had and with some input from planning, we might have a very clean decision to make at the next meeting. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed, great, great. Um, this is Jamie Morris again. Sorry, I, I hit the raise hand button, but I don't know if anybody's monitoring that. Mm. I, I just have one more comment. Um, our closing date is uh, quickly approaching and the potential buyers <laughs> that they're selling and so we do have a very time sensitive matter here um as far as that uh, what's the date of the next meeting hang on 11th yeah okay um and that puts us about four days out from from a proposed closing date which is a pretty tight timeline when you're relocating from another city. Hey, Connor. Yes. I just emailed you a really bad sketch, so um, try that. Okay. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I think I know exactly what you were talking about on that sketch. And I just wanted to mention, I, I put it in the chat. I don't know if anybody saw that, but the only, yeah, actually, that's exactly what I thought you were thinking. The only egress on this house is on the south side of the house. So the people would have to walk outside, take their dog to the backyard, go back, get the dog, walk it back into the house with this particular proposal. I hear that. Does that clarify the motion enough to vote on it, though? Oh, I think that does clarify it enough to vote on it. Is there an opportunity for public comment prior to the vote? Absolutely, Josh. OK, thank you. Um, I, I would certainly say, um, if, if it is possible, this is very informative. Um, and I think definitely gives a lot of encouragement to us that the commission is uh, willing to work with us to have a fence put in place. Um, and if given the opportunity, um, it would you know, be great for us to work with planning and perhaps um, consult uh, some members of the commission um, in a different context to get additional guidance on how to put together a new proposal. Um, because this one as presented um, certainly does uh, you know, bring forth some unique challenges um, as far as being able to enter and exit the house um, and keep everybody safe. Uh, so I, I would love the opportunity to try and um, adjust the proposal um, after we have a survey with consultation from planning and some additional questions to uh, the commission staff and members if possible. Okay, thank you, Josh. Um, so we still have this motion on the table, and I think we still need to uh, take care of that. So let's go ahead and do our vote. Uh, and we'll move from there. Do we, we don't have a second yet, though, do we? Yes, we do. Lee said, Lee oh, okay. Lee said second. Sorry, Lee. You can withdraw. Yes, you can withdraw. I'm, I'm going to withdraw. <laughs> okay. So we withdraw, so we don't have a motion on the table at this point. Very good. All right. So we'll, we'll table this to our next meeting. And uh, Josh, you go ahead and uh, meet with us and meet with planning and, and move forward. And hopefully we can get something worked out for you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it and look forward to the next meeting. Great. Thank you for all your participation. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Thank you Michael. Thank you, uh, Jamie. OK, let's Thank move on Thank to you. our next, our next uh, item on the agenda, 309 South Davison Street, and it'll be COA 2021. This is a contributing property uh, built circa 1910, located in the Greater Prospect Hill Historic District. Um, 
due to a lapse in insurance coverage and poor structural condition of the building, uh, the petitioner has not been able to secure uh, insurance on the home or a builder's loan. So she is requesting to demolish uh, this house uh, with the plans of rebuilding on site uh, a, a structure that's basically within the same footprint. Um, so I've walked the site three times. I can confirm the poor condition of the home, both inside and out. Uh, I know the application didn't show pictures of the inside of the home, um, but it's, it's pretty poor. Uh, what the application did show is the important parts, which is the structural condition of the home, notably the foundation and roof. Um, based on Kevin Potter's report and the report of the petitioner's builder, um, the city was prepared to give the structure an unsafe uh, tag. Uh, however, that didn't happen. Uh, it basically kind of stalled and, and never went anywhere. Um, so while all the construction of the house is obviously substandard, as we saw in the petitioner statement and the structural report, uh, the architectural style is not unique or a rare occurrence in Bloomington. It's not necessarily an endangered architectural style like we saw on West 7th Street. Um, the sheer cost to make this structure livable again seems to really outweigh any incentive to make it to do so. Um, and finally, demolition is supported by the neighborhood. Uh, three members of the Greater Prospect Hill Committee uh, affirmed their support for demolition of this structure to me uh, in emails. Uh, so staff would recommend approval of COA 2021. All right. Uh, we're going to do questions. Uh, Duncan? Um, I questioned some of the figures in the petition. <laughs> I, I've worked on houses worse than this. It didn't cost me $25,000 to pick it up and put a foundation under it. I, I don't, I think the arguments are, some of the arguments are pretty good, but I, I think they basically are trying to persuade us to tear it down as opposed to trying to persuade us to, to save it. And I, I think, you know, this is a, this is a historic district. So I, I just don't think those numbers are reflect my experience. Okay. Uh, Ernesto questions. No questions at this time. Thank you. Jenny. Um, I was wondering, uh, the particular pictures you have right now, are those uh, cedar shakes or something up in the roof? They are. Um, how long has the present owner owned the house? Aviva, are you there? Hi, everybody. My name is Aviva Ornstein. I purchased the house, I'm pretty sure, in December of 2017. And part of the problem is without being able to get a mortgage, I've been moving very slowly on it, um, trying to save up cash. And uh, the first thing we did was dig a trench to make, there was water just flowing in and under the house and drainage has been a huge problem. I, I'll, I'll talk more if you're interested, but um, I, I would, so my goal is to start, if you folks would let me demolish, my goal would be to start yeah. this summer. Um, to respond to, to uh, I think it's Mr. Campbell's comment about the numbers, I do have some, um, some more updated numbers. I, I am not a builder and I don't, so I, I've been sort of relying on other people's kind of ballpark assessments, but we got some more exact numbers, which I gave to Connor just today. And I'd be happy to share those numbers, which I think will probably strike you as more realistic. And I, in, I'm, I'm sort of going on what I, I, I can understand from people what the costs are. And I think they appear to be less than I first imagined when I first did it. But um, I, my argument is not just about costs, but I'd be, I'll be quiet until you folks are done with questions and then I've got a statement. Great, thank you very much. Okay, Chris, questions? Um, I did not have any uh, input from the committee. Do you have the names of the three who supported this demolition? Yes, uh, John Vitello, Doug Wissing, and Patrick Murray. <clears throat> and me. 
Andrew. Um, I guess I would ask maybe this is a, a general question, but how much different is this than many of the houses on the west side? And aren't we then just allowing houses to be demolished for the property value, just the property beneath the house? And then um, I'm sure it's a contributing structure. Uh, you know, contributing structures are not uh, insignificant. They're, they're, they're the makeup of the whole district. So I just don't like this precedent, but I'm thinking the foundation needs a little help, but it's not on piers. It's, it's a traditional limestone foundation. Um, you know, the roof's never been, ever been torn off since it was built, as you can tell from the shakes under the other three layers. I mean, it needs a lot of work. But, you know, that was the condition of much of the West Side. So I'm just thinking, I'm, ask, I'm asking maybe, maybe I should ask staff, what's, what distinguishes this as a property that merits demolition rather than repair or restore? That's a tough question, Chris. You know, it's, it's the same question that we see over and over again. Uh, to me, this is very similar to uh, a demolition request we had last summer in Greater Prospect Hill, Jim Rosenbarger, uh, his uh, little Gable L uh, house, uh, he was requesting demolition. Uh, to me, these are very similar. They both have pretty major structural problems. Um, both times the neighborhood supported demolition um, and neither of those were particularly unique or endangered as far as architectural style goes, meaning that there are other structures similar to those in Bloomington. Um, and so I think that's partially why the commission decided to let Jim's property go. And I just saw that the this case was very similar to that case. And, you know, looking at the past, we've allowed it to go. Um, so that's why I supported demolition. I was wondering too, if uh, zoning changes, we may get the same kind of pressure on smaller houses when people want to make larger projects or duplexes or triplexes, are we setting a precedent? And we think we may be setting a precedent that would just make many of the old houses disposable and work against affordability that way too. The, the property will still be subject to the guidelines that are pretty clear that you couldn't build a, well, maybe you could build a duplex, but it would still have to fit the guideline. I understand that. Is that it, Chris? That was my general question. All right, thank you. Um, Jeff? As I said, I support this in the spirit of the way that this historic district was formed. This is, uh, I hate this term, but it describes it pretty well, historic light. Um, this house, again, is not uh, anything special. And um, it sounds like that the property owner is going to build something that fits in nicely with the neighborhood. Thank you, Jeff. That was not a question. I know. <laughs> we, we get confused for our older ages. Uh, Lee, do you have a question? No, no thanks. And uh, Sam, do you have a question? No questions. All right, let's move to comments. Uh, Duncan? I'll pass for now. Ernesto? Yes, thank you, John. I think uh, I think this house has a lot of character. It might it might not be considered a unique structure, but that's how the West Side neighborhood was built with houses like this, with this character. I think it has great value, even in the shape that it is. Um, there are great examples of how BRI has restore structures in in really bad shape, much worse than this one. And 
I think there's still something to rescue from this really nice structure. I think uh, I have to admit, I'm surprised that we got support from the Prosper Hill, uh, some of the neighbors, I'm, I'm surprised about that. I would be more for trying to restore the existing character of the of the house. I think it has great value. That's all I have for now. May I point out that that's not the house? That's three six. That that's the house. Yeah. yeah. That's your house. It was on three sixteen for a while. Yeah. Now, it's, now it's on three hundred nine. Um, Susan, I am sorry I missed you again. Uh, <laughs> not on purpose. <laughs> Can I get a complex I here, John? I <laughs> I'm here. Okay, uh, no, I, I don't have any questions. I walk by this house every day, and I'm, I'm sorry that it's fallen into such disrepair. It's, it's a tough one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any comments, Susan, where, where we're at? No, that pretty much was it. Thank you. And Jenny, do you have any comments? Okay. I had to unmute myself. I will say that um, I can think of a lot of people that would be very excited to get a house in Prospect Hill uh, in this condition, a friend bought houses in this condition and, you know, we're excited to get them, uh, especially at a fairly affordable price. I'm not sure how much they you paid for it, but uh, I probably would have been very excited <laughs> to get this house. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a little worried about, you know, what's going to go back there. Uh, I understand wanting to start with a fresh slate, um, but uh, I, I really hate to see it go down. Um, I think it has potential. I'll probably have put an addition on it if it goes mm -hmm. well. And uh, I, I'm a little worried because all the houses along there are, have a lot of interest in them and they're smallish houses and they're fairly affordable for that district. And uh, I would really rather not take it down. Thanks. Thank you, Jenny. Okay. Chris? Yep. I'm out of order, I'm sorry. Um, Chris, did you, Chris, you're yeah. going to share comments. I'd like to make comments. All right. If this wasn't a historic district, this would be easy. You know, it's an old house, tear it down, build something new. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it's a historic district means that we have valued all the pieces of this district and they're all contributing and there are very few outstanding or anything beyond contributing in this old historic district. And I have seen too many projects that turn out fantastic, keeping the character of the original house, rebuilding a lot of it, adding a lot on the back. It can do both. It can keep that facade and the historic front to the street that happened in the 20s. And it can be a brand new, beautiful house that fits the livelihood and the, and the future of, of a family. We can do both, but if we just start giving these away, oh yeah, nobody maintained it for a while, throw it out. You know, and then the next one comes down, nobody maintained it for a while, throw it out. You know, we aren't respecting the historic district that says demolitions are not to be, uh, really are not to be allowed without extenuating circumstances that are greater than somebody didn't take care of this house over the years. You know, um, I can't support it. I think in the era of Zoom meetings, we're having Prospect Hill reviews without really a general feedback from the neighborhood and I regret that and I'm going to get more involved and make sure that doesn't continue to happen but I don't th see how we're doing our job if we are willing to let go a house that certainly has a nice street presence 
-hmm. and a ton of potential for it. We've, we've all seen these being added on to, expanded, and their character maintained. You can bo do both. It's not one or the other. And, you know, so many, I know a lot of builders want to just take them down, put them up to different things. It's easier, simpler, but really the quality isn't there when you don't respect the historic character of that house or that neighborhood. And up and down the street, the only difference between this house and most of the rest of the houses on the street is somebody didn't take care of it for a while. That's the only difference. So I can't support allowing this to be demolished. All right, thank you, Chris. Lee? Um, I, if, I totally would echo what Chris just said. Um, I've seen, I've been in homes that were on the brink and have come, you know, come back and have, you know, are still standing in their little gems in their neighborhoods and they add so much character. And I think this house has that potential still. And, but if we, if we uh, allow it to go, it's gonna be gone forever. So I don't think I can support demolition. Thank you. Uh, Sam. Um, uh, I, I read through the structure report that Kevin Potter wrote, and there's, there's obviously some pieces of the house, additions in the back, the roof, that they're just goners. Um, I am concerned that I, the owner, I feel, has gone through their due diligence. They've hired a structural engineer. They've tried to get financing. They can't make it happen. Um, and so saying, oh, you can't tear this down. They, it, it points to a, a failure of resources for people who want to restore an historic house. And um, I hear what Chris, what Lee, what you guys were saying. Um, but then my question back to you too is like, how can we help them? Because they're trying, obviously they're trying. Um, but if we don't allow them to tear it down and build a compatible house, what are the alternatives? Um, I'm sorry, that's not really a question, but that's kind of where I'm coming from. Okay, Sam, thank you. Um, you know, I've done my, my kind of, uh, okay, so I've done houses before, and I have, I have not had a lender turn me down for a construction loan to renovate a property. Um, and so I find that a little hard to believe that the lenders aren't willing to lend money, especially in a neighborhood as this is. Um, however, I do sympathize, sympathize with the owner about trying to get something she'd like to have. Um, and again, it's, it's, as Chris was saying, it's another one of those little things out there that we start losing the fabric of our neighborhood. So that's my comment. I, I have an additional comment if I could. Yeah. This is an investment. It's not, oh, you must make it somebody's home. It's an investment and it may become somebody's home, but this isn't a situation of hardship. This is a situation of Somebody got a good deal on this property and they'd like to get rid of the house that's on it. And our responsibility is to decide, is that okay? Is that what we're here for? I would suggest that we are here to protect that property and see that it passes into the future. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, the petitioner of the do you have some more comments for us? I do. I will try and be brief. Thanks for your attention. Thank uh, first, you. first, I want to just tell you that historically, the reason I chose this house is I hope to retire to it and make it my own. So I'm not doing this as sort of a flip or a got a good deal. The, um, the house directly, I guess I'm going to get my uh, east of um, that house belongs to my best friend uh, who knew her neighbor. At, oh, no, I'm sorry. Is that, I think that's 
back back up the alley is 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 right right behind my house back up the alley is Jessica Mott's house and uh, she talked to her neighbor and frankly we did this very informally I my total goal walking in was to rehab the house it wasn't that I came in thinking I would like to just tear this down and start over rather what happened was as we looked at it it just the more and my, my builder Steve is on on the line as well and I'll ask him he can answer questions as we looked at it, it just became increasingly difficult to imagine. I think, um, I think that it's, the foundation is more than it needs a little work. It just has been flooded repeatedly. And we can't, at least according to Steve, what we can't do is dig deeply enough to really handle some of the, um, the water problems. And that if we could excavate, if we could demolish and excavate, I would dig deeply enough to get a basement and then the, the floor would be over where the water is running and I wouldn't have all the, the uh, problems. It's really, when you walk inside, there was not, the man who had owned the home came and mowed the lawn for 10 years. What I didn't realize is that he didn't insure the property for 10 years, which meant that I'm unable to get insurance and nobody will touch this as a loan. I really have tried to go around and they said, when you, they said, if it's, if it's plain land, fine, but if not, you have to wait until it passes a business, a building inspection. And this house is just, the smell of mildew is overwhelming. Nothing works. Uh, it was, and, and I think Steve documented that it was built not to code at the time it was built. This is, uh, you know, I have tremendous respect for the appearance of the house. The neighbors were so cheered on. I don't, I don't recognize the names of the three people you mentioned, but they were so thrilled that somebody had taken it over because it is a ridiculous eyesore. For me, there's just a lot of sentimental value there. Um, but from, you know, from what, this is not a case where I'm trying to just zip up a good value and somebody just let it go. A very eccentric man came and mowed the lawn for a long time. And I don't think anybody realized what was going on inside. And, to, and, and I was the first person he led inside in 10 years. When I bought it, I had no notions of demolishing it. I didn't realize, I, I just thought this would be, you know, we're gonna bring it down to the studs and then bring it back to life. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about the foundation issues um, and the, the, the way the house was framed. Uh, I would love to be able to have a little, um, shelter in the and you know create a basement and a turn uh, and a tornado room and put the utilities downstairs i will commit to having a house that looks exactly like i think this is an adorable house and i'd like to and i commit to using the right kind of um uh, the right uh building materials i don't want it to look at a character there's i have no interest in a duplex or a mcmansion or anything like that what i just want to do is make it possible that I don't have to pile up cash for the next four years to be able to build it. And I think that that um, Steve shared with me, uh, and I don't know, Connor, if you can screen share that thing I typed up. I do, you know, I am, I would love to hear that, oh, it's no big deal to just lift up the house and this will be easy to do. But I, it's, it's the foundation stuff that I'm most concerned about. I think the roof is totally gone. And um, I think it says something that everyone who's actually walked around it and looked at it just thinks it's not salvageable. I'm, there's no way you could let somebody live in the house as is. And I, it would be hard for me to imagine just because of some of the toxic mold in there that it's a good idea to just sort of try and keep what's there. But um, Connor, if you could share the screen with, with that chart that um, Steve made. This, is, is this not it? Do we see it here? No, I, I'm still seeing just the house. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think, uh, Mr. Sternbaum, this might make you feel better. I think that we have, we have more numbers that look probably more in alignment. There's, we didn't see a $25,000 difference. We saw more of a, I think when we're all said and done a $17,000 difference. For me, it's as much about wanting to feel like the foundation is solid and wanting to have a um, it, no water running through underneath the way it's graded right now there was just water pouring through um, 
than just about the extra extra difference. Um, these, you know, these are these are numbers that we just got the other day by Steve going around to various um, various folks. So I, maybe I hope these are realistic. I, I am really not trying to um, make a case other than the one I'm making to you. And I'm not trying to inflate it or otherwise, obviously, be dishonest with you folks. I just came to the conclusion that this would be the, the better and I would be able to build a better house if I could start from scratch. Not because I wanna go through neighborhoods and do that, but I think this particular house, I did not buy it with that intention, but this particular house is, is really hard to imagine getting back up to what we would want. So I think, did you say your statistics were such that it was $17,000 more expensive to fix the old house than to build the new one? I, well, I mean, I, let me, oh, can you, can you scroll down a little bit? Um, uh, yes, including a seven, a uh, $5,000, uh, a $5,000 benefit from having a basement. Um, Steve, are you there? This is Steve's first time on Zoom. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, hold on one second. Hold on, sorry. He's not on, but he got the time wrong. Um, so I, to the best that I understand it, it's, um, uh, Steve is telling me that it'd be $17,000 difference. But the problem is that I can't get, oh, I, I am, I am if, if you, Mr. Chairman, if you know somebody who'll give me a mortgage on a property that has not been insured in 10 years, that was the killer, that nobody will, nobody will touch it. I really, I went around and asked and the same, and the insurance, I had one guy who gave me just an astronomical sum. So I did get one bid at the end, but I, again, I would say I spoke to, at least seven people about trying to insure it. So my own the USAA wouldn't touch it. There was just, there's so much that makes it much harder that if we could start from scratch with full respect for what is, you know, I, I'm not sure I understand the entire enterprise, but I do know that what you don't want is something that looks out of character with the neighborhood or somehow is, um, or somehow is disrespectful and that is not gonna happen. You're saying that with a full estimate of what to do and what will happen, you couldn't get any kind of mortgage on the house? I couldn't. Now, I, I, I didn't go to as many mortgage, I, I spoke to three mortgage people. I didn't, but, but, but what would happen is they would just shut down and say, look, we can't give you a builder's mortgage if there's an existing structure. It's either start from scratch or go forward. And I, if I remember correctly, I think part of the problem was that it had not been insured. And so nobody was gonna to touch it and I couldn't have insurance while they were working on it, which made everybody super nervous. Hmm. I mean, I, I, all I can say is I, I totally respect what the, all the considerations you have, but to the extent that you're worried that you're setting a precedent of some rapacious person who's coming in to game the system, that is not this house. This is, I want to listen, live next to my best friend in my old age. And I, I think. That. And I, I would just like to say, I can, I can vouch for Aviva's story. I, I met with her almost a year ago on this house. Um, and her original plans, all she talked about was rehabbing, restoring the house. That was definitely her original plans. But I think as her and Steve got deeper into it, deeper into it, that plan obviously changed more than uncovered. Uh, so, uh, you know. What, another reason I guess I would support this is something that I get asked by petitioners like Aviva um, is, well, what kind of funding or grant money do you have for me to, to restore this project, you know, this house? This is extremely expensive. And I have to just tell people, well, we don't have any money for you. Whatever the, however, the Historic Preservation Commission tells you to spend your dollars, that's how you got to spend your dollars. And it, it, it's, it's tough for people uh, to get that. And it, it really hurts historic preservation in this community. Um, so I'll stop there, but I do want to vouch for Aviva's story. 
Well, if it's a hardship case, though, aren't I understood that there were several other houses that were owned by the petitioner. This isn't a one of kind of situation. But no, that's fair. I'm not, I'm, I really wouldn't want to put my, it, it would be ridiculous for me to say that it's a financial hardship in the sense that I, I, I would be homeless or that, you know, that, that I'd have to compromise on basic needs. It is, I would say in, in equal measure, a concern about the extra cost that I will have to, because I, I can't get alone, that I will just have to spend time accruing. And the fact that I'm, I, when my understanding of how that foundation is, is not working is that um, I won't, that if we jack up the house, we'll be able to, to, to get maybe 14 inches or maybe to the minimum of the code, but we won't be able to dig significantly to do the kind of thing that I think would be really good for the house which is have a, um, you know, we wouldn't need a sump pump. We would be able to go straight to, um, I wouldn't have to worry about drainage. There would be, a, there would be a, a, a place for a tornado, which would make me happy and a place for utilities. Um, I, I see that as a huge benefit. And um, I, I, it's not one that I needed going in, but once I, but, but, but the prospect of, of having Every, you know, the, the way in which everything was done poorly and that uh, I think Steve did a great job documenting it, so I won't review it, um, made me feel this was just not a st safe structure. And just to reiterate, you have my commitment that whatever gets built is entirely, we do have plans. I'm working with, um, um, with Barry Clapper and, um, she she is totally on she we've thought about an addition to the back of the house that would allow a master bedroom and a another bathroom um but at the street view i think would be entirely the same we're we're, we're really at we're i i think it's a super cute house and it's it's the place I, and i'm gonna also have a ramp in the back so it's gonna be that I, i'm anticipating hopefully an old age that allows me to live alone and I'm building an entirely accessible house. All right, thank you. Do we have any more comments? I do not, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Anita. I have a couple of comments. Thank you. The house was built originally on piers, uh, Chris. I went out and looked at it. The corner piers are still there, but the concrete block was put in underneath to make it look better. It was never really structural in the sense that it supported the house. According to the engineer, it, there's no footing. So somebody laid up limestone around the house, but I don't believe it was original to the structure. Um, I believe it was sitting on piers and I, I'm pretty sure at least two of the corners I could see where it's excavated, you can still see the pier. The walls are straight. The roof is wavy because it's got too much weight on it because nobody's ever bothered to take shingles off. The, the, the description of the construction um, by the engineer who, by the way, knows as well as anyone what these house, how these houses are built because he's experienced them a lot and he's our, our sort of go-to guy for this kind of thing. Um, it's notable that he didn't recommend tearing it down. He recommended ways to make it sound. Um, so I don't think the fact that there's an engineer's report should be translated into it ought to go. Uh, Kevin was pretty explicit about things that could be done to uh, enhance the structure where he felt it was lacking. Chris has worked on lots of these houses. I've worked on a couple of dozen of them on the west side at the very least. Um, BRI's done 30 or 40 of these. Um, and so I think part of the problem is we're not maybe asking the right people what the solutions are. I, I, uh, Aviva, I would very seriously consider calling Steve Wyatt at Bloomington Restorations and, and doing a walkthrough and let him show you what they've been able to do for often well under $100 a square foot to rectify these houses. They're all over this neighborhood. And, and so, the, you know, and if you're going to build an addition anyway, put your shelter under the addition. I mean, that's just common sense. So I, I don't 
I don't agree that the condition of it is necessarily shoddy. A lot of these houses were built by homeowners and by people who were less than professional. The fact that it didn't meet code standards of today, the test is it's still standing there <laughs> and it's standing there straight. It's, it's very straight. The ridge, the, the soffit, the fascia, the sides, you know, houses that are falling down are not straight. Um, I walked around it for quite a while today. Um, stuck my head in the crawl space. Yeah, it's crummy. <laughs> I, I get it. But honestly, I don't think that you, the advice you're getting from your advisors is, is necessarily uh, based in, exper in their experience and what can happen. I, I can't make a guarantee, but I can almost assure you you could restore this house for cheaper than you could build a new one. And I know how inconvenient that is for people who aren't in that business, but for people who are in that business, it's a, it's a slam dunk, basically. And the issues of lead and insulation and all the other things that you very, you know, your explanation and rationale is, is a beautiful thing to read. I, I, I think you really made a, a real effort, but it's not, it it's not convincing to me because my experience has told me over and over again that this can be done. I, I, be, I rebuilt a barn on my property that was leaning so badly, I couldn't get the excavator to stay in the driveway long enough to give me a bid. So, I mean, honestly, this is, this is I, I, you know, I think Kevin Potter's have a very accurate description of his condition, but it's not a condition that can't be rectified. And, and in terms of what Chris is saying about, you know, precedence, I mean, Connor himself quoted a precedent where we, where we allowed somebody else to tear a house down. Every time we allow somebody to tear one down, it's one more example of why we ought to do it more often. And that's got to stop. This is a historic district. You don't tear houses down in historic districts unless they're practically down already. So I just, I don't, I don't buy it. I totally support the owner and her effort. I totally believe her honesty and and, and everything, but I think it just, it's just a matter of getting the right, the right advice. And, and BRI has access to money from Indiana Landmarks to do projects like this. We've leveraged revolving loan funds from them over and over again. The, the problem you describe in terms of financing shouldn't have to exist and there are solutions to it. So I, I don't, there are just, just plain construction loans for renovation and that can be insured. So, you know, that I, I'll be honest with you, that part I really have investigated and haven't, um, and have come up empty. So, and, and when I, you mentioned a name of a person and I asked him, uh, pardon? Steve Wyatt is the director of Bloomington. Yeah, yeah. I asked him who, who I, who could help me with insurance and he gave me some names and they all turned up empty. Okay, well, I, I'm not convinced. I mean, because we've done so many of these projects, we don't do them without insurance. <laughs> you know, and neither does anybody else. So, I mean, talk to Chris. He, he does these projects all the time. It's, 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 that's not something I would let, I would not that let a lender convince me that a house has to be torn down. That, that's my bottom line on that. And, you know, I don't know what your recent, what your, you know, available resources are or anything, but, the, you know, these houses can be done in phases. Several people, you know, my own house, it took me 25 years to do it. I'm not going to live that long, Mr. Campbell. <laughs> okay, well, I didn't think I was either. But honestly, I mean, you know, I just, I just don't agree that the solution here is to remove the house. I just can't. I, I, I've seen too much. I've seen them too often be successful. The house across the street is a successful example of somebody who's of a house that was saved. There's two more down the street. This is, you know, this shouldn't happen. That's it. Any more comments? All right. We need a motion. We need a motion. I move to deny the demolition of 309 South Davison Street. Second. Okay. Roll call. Uh, Lee, did you, were you the one that seconded that? Yes, I, I was. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sam DeSoller. Yes. Susan Dyer. Yes. Jeff Golden. No. 
Lee Sandweiss. Yes. John Saunders. Yes. Chris Sturbaum. Yes. Motion carries five one zero. Thank you. We do wish you luck, and we do Thank wish you. it works out for you. Thanks very much. I will. I will. I will go ahead with the you know the very super slow plan. I appreciate your attention, and um, I learned a lot about the house doing this, so it wasn't a waste of time. So thanks a lot. Thank feel you. Free, feel free to contact any of us if you need some more help. Uh, who said that? John Saunders, right here. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, let's John, move on to... to... John? Yes. Uh, could I just tell Eddie that I finally showed up because I got lost in my calendar? I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, All Eddie. All right. Uh, let's move on to COA 20-22, 102 West 6th Street. Uh, Paul, are you with us? I'm here. Great, thank you. All right, this is a non-contributing uh, commercial structure in the Courthouse Square Historic District. Uh, the building's undergone significant alterations. Uh, the petitioner's request is part of a project to eliminate roof leaks and enhance the building's drainage system. Uh, the request is to install gutters along the cornice line of the building, uh, similar to what has been done in the building directly to the west. Uh, this one here. Uh, the plan is to uh, install uh, gutter along the cornice line here and then tap into the downspout that already exists on this building here. Um, so staff consulted with the applicant. We suggested the current proposal is a way to eliminate the roof trough, which you see here is currently uh, used to drain. And it's constantly being clogged up by uh, students uh, who are up on the building illegally with trash and other things. Um, so commercial buildings built in the late 19th century usually had uh, roofs that sloped to the rear or internal guttering systems. These roofs were typically hidden by a masonry parapet. Uh, you can see here this building originally did have one um, that has since been removed. Um, so uh, really if you run a case style gutter along the facade and you accent it to match uh, it really looks nice and it kind of it pops um, and creates kind of that, that cornice line is missing a little bit. Uh, so for those reasons, staff would recommend approval. Okay. All right, Duncan, questions? No, no questions. Ernesto, questions? No questions, thank you. Jenny, questions? You're muted, Jenny. There we go. Now my only question is how are the students getting up there? That's uh... a... <laughs> Would you like me to answer that question? Uh, <laughs> sure, it's building, curiosity more than... <laughs> the building right to the west has a rooftop access which gives them access for their apartments and then they can climb right from that over a small railing to get on top of 102 West 6th Street, mm -hmm. and then they sit and dangle over that edge and throw beer cans down in our scupboard. I would really encourage you to do a no trespassing sign up there so that you can disclaim uh, liability at the very least. We, we have, and we've talked to the building owner and um, done what we can. Great. Uh, Chris? No. Jeff? No questions. Lee? No questions. Sam? What's the size of the downspout? And have you run calculations on the added load to that downspout? So the current downspout is already servicing that scupper. So the entire uh, internal drainage system goes into a box, which then feeds down into the same downspout. So we're not changing anything on additional water. It's just gonna be run from an external gutter, which be which will catch less waste and be easier to clean and, and eliminate the amount of debris. And a K gutter is basically a residential gutter, right? That's right. That's what I got. Thank you. All right, Susan? No, no questions. 
Thank you. Will it be black or red or what's it going to be? I was hoping you'd tell me, Chris. <laughs> Duncan, comments? Questions? Uh, I don't really have any questions. So we're on comments. Um, yeah, I, I, I sympathize with the problem. I, I, you know, I think I, I know these, these internal troughs are really hard to maintain. It's hard to keep them clean. Uh, you know, students are not. Um, it's hard to get them to function. And when they don't, you get a a very wet building. Um, it's too bad in some ways that these buildings were, you know, these cornices were taken off, but but that basically the cornices just held an internal gutter system. They they weren't they weren't any better for protecting from from dampness. The trick here is to make it look as nice as possible, and I because it's kind of a streamlined modern design. I, you know, maybe I don't think that's really going to be too hard. I would I wouldn't recommend a K gutter. I I just put up a a box gutter, uh, a flat fronted box gutter um, that you know match the color of the building as closely as possible. I wouldn't try to make a design element out of it. I'd try to hide it. Um, but I you know I I think it, it it sounds like it will function better. You still have to keep it clean. I mean, beer bottles land in gutters too, so. It's not going to totally solve the problem, but um, you don't have a pitch forward like they do next door where they have that gutter. So they've got a little hip coming into it, but <clears throat> I'm not quite sure how you're going to keep it clean. But, um, you know, Paul, it's, it's, it's going to have its own problem. <laughs> so I, you know. I, so, so Dun um, and I appreciate your advice there one of the things that's happening is is that it's it's so many of those problems are going to the internal structure and deteriorating just in a vacant area which the owner will ultimately um hope to uh renovate with right. with your board's approval and so one of the things that we want to do is is prepare to protect the structure and the restaurant that's currently there but what we'll do is we'll build a we'll just kind of fill in that area and create out of iso board and just epdm or tpo some sort of structure that will gradually slope with enough slope on a commercial roofing membrane which will tear, carry it to that box gutter like you're yeah. recommending and then it takes the water outside the building yeah i i, I think that's a good solution i i support it thank you duncan ernesto no questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. Comments? I wasn't. I'll comment. I wasn't prepared to think what color that should be. Uh, Duncan's <laughs> suggestion was to hide it. Is that is that an external gutter on the on the left side on the above yeah. the building to the left? Yep. Yeah. And this will be a different height. Or will they try to unify or no, they'll be distinct. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, I was gonna say we're open to either way. If right. we lowered it to match that height, that certainly wouldn't hurt anything. It would just except for you know, the amount of runoff would then I I would say I would be afraid would exceed the capacity of the gutter and then would, right. would drain down onto the, the street. Right. I'd like Sam or Ernesto to suggest something. Uh, Ernesto, you got anything? I have lots. <laughs> um, I'll sit tight. You go first. <laughs> All right. So, okay. Thank you. Um, so, I, I did a little t tour around the square, and one of the things that makes you know, there's really nothing particularly addressing uh, drainage in the guidelines for this district. That said, I went around the district. And the only building that has a gutter on the front facade is the Kingdo one. Well, the uh, what formerly was known, sadly, as Kingdo. Um, and it looks like hell, in part because it's a residential gutter system. If you look at, if you sort of zoom in on the area where the scupper and the gutter join, um, that's, d does the same owner own both of these buildings? No. No? No. So the owner from the Kingdo building is sort of glommed because it looks like from Google Maps and from like wandering around that that 
downspout is actually on the front of the Grassi building. Um, and if they're actually allowed to go into that downspout, um, I think my big issue is that you're basically using a residential system which isn't built for, see how it goes down along the front of the, the limestone, that, um, that black downspout and the scupper is located on the front of limestone. And then you've got these sort of um, ridiculous, uh, you know, sort of uh, snakes coming down from the gutter, a couple of them. Um, it's, it's a patch job, it's not great. Um, but the big issue I have is that you've got a downspout on the public frontage. And I think this is actually an opportunity to make that a little less horrible. Um, I would second Duncan's comments that you put in a box gutter, that you put it up above the limestone. You're gonna have to have some kind of slope. And if you put a K gutter in there, the slope from uh, the, you know, the sort of east end to the west end is gonna have to be significant enough that you're gonna have drop along the gutter and it's gonna look like hell. So if you can incorporate that into the actual box gutter, it'll be a hell of a lot cleaner. Sorry, I'm um, being a little more profane than I wanna be, but I am. Uh, I really don't want to see That's okay. another residential solution placed on a commercial building. Um, and then if you can upgrade the residential downspout, which is basically a three by four aluminum downspout into something that's a little more commercial. And like, I mean, the building is non-contributing, but it's a building that's, you know, it's an international style building. If you did it out of like a... I want to say stainless, but you're not going to get that here. So something that's at least um, at, at street level, very beefy, so that when people whack into it, it's not going to dent and look like crap. Um, I think that would help. Uh, and then if you sort of clean up the intersection of everything that's going on up at the top, I think that would help a lot too. I don't have any issue with them. Um, Actually, I do have some issues with them, but I'm willing to like choke it down if they clean it up uh, of, of basically not fixing the uh, integral downspouts, which every other building has. And you look at every other building on the square, the drainage doesn't go down the front. It goes down to the back. It goes down the sides. It goes down an alley. No other building on the square has a gutter except for King Doe. And I think that is a subtle thing, but it... Um, it's contributory to why the square looks the way it does. And if you start chipping away at that, um, it's, an, it's an issue. So uh, I would advocate for a commercial box gutter and replacing both connections to the gutters, uh, both from the Kingdo building and the Grazi building to something that's cleaner, um, to a more commercial grade uh, box gutter and downspout. I'm done now. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Well, Sam, um, he, can't, he can't touch King Doe building. He's only working on the Grassy building. The only reason I said that is because the King Doe building feeds into that. So if you're going to mess around with any of the downspout uh, on the Grassy building, it, in essence, and he also said that the, that the current drainage from the Grassy building goes into that downspout, which is only as, I, as far as I can see coming from the, the Grassi building. You've got two snakes coming both from the Grassi building. From the King Doe building. My bad, the King Doe building. The scupper, if, if that scupper, that box scupper, that's the higher one, is actually from the Grassi building, it's on the King Doe building. Yeah. So, so I can weigh in there. I've been up there a bunch. It's actually where that box connection comes. A third connection comes in there from underneath, from behind that parapet wall and jumps straight into there. So it's not, that box is all on the King Doe building. Um, <laughs> but you're plugged into it. So who owns the downspout that goes all the way down? It's a great question. And if you tell me, I'd gladly work with them. I think it's a combined wall. So, you know, there's a 12 inch wall. So OEI, the owner of the Grazi building, owns six inches of that wall. I assume somewhere before me ever getting involved, there was an agreement that that downspout would be able to service both. They do go into a street level 
uh, drainage system that then goes underneath the curb. And there you go. I think Connor's pointed out right now and it spits out on that lower sidewalk. So at least not to cause problem on the, on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My big issue is like you get down the street level, you've got an aluminum downspout or mm -hmm. residential aluminum downspout, like at street level where a bunch of drunken college students have um, access to it. Can I make my comment, John? Yes, please. Minister. I agree with Sam 100%. I mean, we just can't do what is there on that building next door. That's just not. Um, it, it is very true that all the water should run to the back, to the alley, or to the side. Um, so a box gutter uh, would be the appropriate way to go. Um, that's all. I just agree with uh, with Sam and, and Duncan. Thank you. Um, Paul? You're talking about that we can't see the third entrance. Is that the one coming from Grazi? Is that the one that's there? So it's highly possible that that current system belongs to OEI if we're currently tapping it. I would I would say it's a possibility to, to speak to getting water to either the back of the building or an alley. Clearly, the building's landlocked between 100 and then 108 uh, West Sixth uh, Street. There, so so I don't have an I don't have access because this parapet wall. Then, if you look directly behind that, that wall or that height of the roof is extended about six feet. I can't get water up without mechanically creating a way to do that or go east or west. So my only option to get water out of this area, aside from squaring off the building and elevating the front facade up that additional six feet above that parapet wall, which is about three feet above what is down there in the scupper, I don't have an option to take water anywhere else other than down one of the sides, uh, down the building, I guess is what I'm, I would, I would like to add to this. So I, a box gutter would work if, if, if the owner of, of King Doe building there would allow us to increase that gutter working together with a shared cost or even quite frankly, OEI would probably just, you know, be glad to do the right thing there. Um, it would just be a working together with your neighbor. Um, and we, we would, we would facilitate that certainly. Thank you, Paul. Um, let's move on to some more comments. Uh, Jeff. So I also agree with Sam in the previous comments around the box gutter. I don't think a uh, residential K gutter is appropriate in this use. And it would be really nice to, to get something that looks more commercial, just, you know, including the downspout. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Lee? I echo what um, Jeff said and what Sam said. Uh, box gutter, more commercial downspout. Okay, thank you. Deb? Yeah. I agree with everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, Sam, you made your comments. Susan? Yeah, I'd agree with that too. And I'm agree with the group as well. Is there any color choice reference? I'd love stainless, but hey, I mean, I think the other appropriate choice is to match the uh, frame of the window. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Any other? Even that beige could happen, maybe. Okay. Uh, can we get a motion, please? Could, could I, I actually like to move to continue this. Sorry. I'd just like to ask a clarification question, just just if that's okay. Yes, please do. It certainly anything that we're advised to do at one hundred two slash one hundred four and six uh, West Sixth Street will will adhere to. Um, I don't know that we have jurisdiction or or, or authority to change the downspout mm -hmm. as it comes down the building. We can certainly work with them. I don't want to be misleading in this. We'll certainly do whatever we need to do across our facade of the building and then work with them. But I don't want to. I don't want to leave this in a, a, a this meeting saying that I can certainly 
um, do anything that I can't, that I don't have authority to do. We'll work to do that. But so if I don't have control of that downspout, I'll work with the owner to try, the, the owner of King Doe to try to come with, come to a resolution. But I don't want to be misleading here. I got a quick question. Uh, yeah. If you don't have authority on the downspout, does the build the water from your building still actually now go down through that downspout? Yes, they both share it. I'm just saying I'll have to work with them to come to an agreement. And even if we ac accept the cost, I assume they'd be willing to do that. I just don't want to be misleading. We'll, we'll certainly work with the owner and, 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 and try to get something resolved. But I just don't want to say, like if you guys recommend that I do a box gutter at a beige color or a limestone looking color, and then it goes into this downspout and we, and then further tell me to make that larger, I'll, I'll work with the owner of that building and we'll get that taken care of, but I can't speak for them. I can only speak for the, the rep, you know, what I represent here. Gotcha. Um, it would certainly be in their interest to get that gutter flow, flowing and functioning well for the future too, to enlarge and quite clean it up. I have an idea for a motion, if uh, that would be helpful. Yes, please. I would uh, move to continue this to the next meeting until the owner has a chance to coordinate with the owner of the adjacent building and present to us uh, a documentation of what we've talked about with a box gutter and uh, whatever downspout uh, he's able to uh, coordinate with the adjacent building owner. Second. OK. Okay. I take it that was, uh, of course, Sam made the motion and yes. Chris, Chris seconded. Yeah. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, Sam DeSolar. Excuse, yeah. excuse me a second. I, I think you need the owner's representatives okay on a continuance. If you're going to continue the meeting, you have to get some. Uh, you have to get some agreement. Is that amenable? I, I would ask for permission to begin repairing just our portion of the internal structure of the building and get ready for a box gutter if that's what we're going to go with and then table the downspout question for later just because we actively have water entering our building and so I have put on hold repairing that until this meeting and it's going to rain tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I think that's reasonable. I do too. Okay. Sam, do you want to modify your motion then? Yeah, I would I would amend my motion to include that the owner may uh, immediately uh, begin repairs to secure the uh, interior of the building from moisture infiltration. Okay. Do we have a second? Chris? Is he not asking to start on the gutter part too? Yes. Well, not the gutter part. He's just, I thought, I thought he was just talking about getting the, the building watertight. Yes. The and only the gutter part. issue is the shared responsibility. And that's what you wanted a future review of so that it didn't get done wrong, I think. Is that right, Sam? I want a future review of both the box gutter and the downspout. If he needs to start to uh, sort of block off the interior of the scuppers, to protect the interior of the building from water infiltration. I don't have an issue with that. Does anybody else? I mean, there may be some water that spills out onto the street in the meantime, and I don't know. I just don't understand why we're talking about the downspout on the King Doe building. It's not on the King Doe building, as far as I can tell. I mean, the building, this building spills down into that downspout. Right, but he's but Paul's saying it's not his downspout, and he can't guarantee that anyone can ever touch that downspout in the future ever again. So, you know, why don't I, it's I, on the Grazzi building? It's pretty clear. Paul, no, Paul just told you guys several times it's not their downspout. He doesn't own the downspout, and he can't guarantee that anything is ever done with the downspout. He told us he doesn't know. <laughs> they share it. It's a shared downspout. He's going to enter into negotiations. In good faith, and in good faith, we will, you know, we will accept what comes. But you know, it's it. From all I can see, it, it is on the Grazi building, and that's the building we're speaking of. It's actually King Doe. Yeah. I'm sorry, Paul. Please. 
I would just like to say I'd like to get this in a position where I can square off this scupper, get this. If, if we if we could get to a point where we could agree on a box cutter and color and temporarily go into this downspout and in good faith, maybe the motion is in good faith on the next meeting, I'll have gone further in working with the owner of that building to upgrade that downspout because it's a shared downspout. I could do that, but that gives me a month of time to get this squared off and get a box cutter built to your color. Uh, recommendation and then the downspout be the tabled item and I don't know if it works that way that's just a recommendation or a request I would like before you put the box gutter in um, one of the things that I'm concerned about is the slope of the box gutter because uh, you know you have to have water has to go somewhere and it's got to drain for gravity right so if you stick that on the top of that uh, horizontal cornice line it looks like a six inch limestone cornice um, it would be nice if the slope of the box gutter was contained within the box gutter and you didn't see it on the front side of the building, if that makes sense. Oh, I think you understand very well the mission of this project is to make it as inconspicuous as possible. And I think that's what Sam's trying to say also. And I agree with that. And it'll take a little bit of time to do some planning and and. Yeah. and but, but but certainly I don't want to go forward with us with the beginning of a structural repair that's going to lead to a wrong elevation because I'm misunderstanding where we're going to go if my box cutter. Now I can build a box yeah. cutter certainly, but I don't want to start this project and, and waste money if it's not going to be an approval because to do the repairs that I need to do this to stop water infiltration, I've got to elevate a roof line and square that off and then put ISO board and insulation and then a, a, a rubber roofing, a TPO or an EPDM um to, to 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 stop this water infiltration and and i don't want to do that without your, your this this board's approval sometimes we've given approval and then kind of consulted as you proceed so that you get a little feedback as it happens yeah Chris, you members. did that you did that with me specifically on the project at 100 west kirkwood, or east kirkwood there on the on the trojan horse project you and duncan duncan came over multiple times and were super helpful with that project and i would i would gladly gladly allow that to happen again or request that that happen again. So that should reassure Sam to make the motion. I have a quick okay. question before you make the motion for Connor. Connor, if he makes a box cutter totally out of sight, uh, does he even need our approval? It's no. not out of sight. It's not out of sight. It's going to be along the front face of the building. To answer Jane's question, the answer is no. But we're in a, having a COA right now because the current proposal is it would be inside. Okay. It's going to run along the top of that uh, horizontal six inch limestone, you know, one inch pop out at the top of the Grazi building. Is it sitting on top or right under? Well, so, so that wasn't the original request. So I can't answer that question other than to say that I'm open to either way. I think I think it would be um, a little bit better uh, to pop it, just set it on top of that cornice line, so that the cornice line reads and it's not covered up. Agreed. So that, mean, that means the roof line behind is going to be a little bit higher, but I don't think I don't think anybody cares. You've got room to do it. You've got room to get the slope working, uh, and I think it might actually be cleaner to. Um, give yourself a little more room to play up there. Frankly, Sam, that makes my job easier. So I, I'm, I, 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 yeah, we're not trying to make it hard. I, you know, I'm an architect and so I'm fussy about stuff. Um, but I, 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 I understand how stuff, well, unlike some other architects, I understand how stuff is built and I don't want to give you a hard time. Um, except I want it to be, I want it to look good. <laughs> and we're not disturbing that facade, which is nice. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes, that very original non-contributing facade. I know. I know. I, Connor, I hear you. I mean, we're being totally fussy, but... It's limestone. It's almost old enough to be historic. It probably is. It's, old but it's also, it's also rated as non-contributing. So, right. you know, if, if, they, if, if they tack a low-slope roof behind it that feeds into a gutter that just sits on top of it, I think that'll probably be a little easier to build than something that hangs down the front of it. Um, you've got a little bit, you've got a little bit more latitude to muck around with what happens behind it. 
Okay. And there was some architectural intent there. It just wasn't original. It's yeah. true. <laughs> so what's our motion on the table now? Um, uh, uh, let's see, where were we? Um, so we moved to uh, uh, approve the uh, applicant's request to put a gutter on there, but we want it to be a box gutter. We want it to feed into a downspout at the existing downspout location, which will hopefully be upgraded, uh, but that's in good faith negotiation with the adjacent owner. Uh, color to be uh, approved by staff, probably ma matching either the, the beige down below or the window frame. Is that fair? Second. Yes. Okay. Second. Is that, is, that, is that clear enough uh, for the owner? Yes. Uh, Paul, is that clear? Okay. Yes, thank you. All right, let's do roll call. Okay, so that was still it was it, the motion was still made by Sam yep. and was seconded by Chris, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Uh Sam DeSaller. Yes. Susan Dyer. Yes. Jeff Golden. Yes. Deb Hutton. Yes. Lee Sandweiss. Yes. John Saunders. Yes. Chris Sturbaum. Yes. Motion carries seven zero. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thank you for your patience, Thank you guys. I appreciate your time. <laughs> so let's move on to demolition delay, and this is uh, three hundred one West Seventeenth Street, and it's twenty dash twelve. Yeah, this is a contributing uh, commercial structure. Um, it is uh, the petitioner's requesting full demolition. It looks like the it was an old uh, food restaurant, whether that's a drive-through or a drive-through sit-in place combination. Um, I haven't been around in Bloomington long enough. Maybe you guys know this may have been the best burger joint in Monroe County. Swing, Swing in pizza. pizza. Swing in pizza. pizza. Okay, you know it. Great. Um, so I don't need to say anything else. Uh, but I would recommend releasing the demolition delay. Is a petitioner with us? Yeah, I'm Carl Clark and uh, I'm the petitioner. Great. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Clark? Well, the, no, just the main thing, the building is just so short. <laughs> the door, it's got an extra small door at the front and um, it's just, it's just way too short, it's the whole problem. And it's not a complete demo. We are keeping uh, the blocks along the footprint, The footprint, the footprint and everything. We're just gonna go up from there. So it's gonna be the same size and all that. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, questions? Duncan. So uh, when you say it's not gonna be a full demolition, you're keeping the footprint, but are you keeping any of the building or is it all coming down to the ground? No, we're keeping the foundation. <clears throat> well, which is below grade. No, it's above grade, it's cement block. Okay, so you're keeping it all the way to the, to the red, <laughs> to the roof? No, no, like the bottom of the windows. Okay, okay. And then the, I see another picture here below, is that what's getting built? Yes. Yeah. That's the only question I have. Great. Ernesto? No questions. Thank you. Jenny? Jenny? Sorry. Uh, yes, are they going to be using the old sign out front or are they taking that down also? We were, we were planning on using the old sign. Okay. Is this full historic, Connor? What do you mean? Um, Demolition it... delay. Okay, so it's not in a in a historic district. Correct. It's a demolition delay outside of historic district. Okay. Commercial. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jenny. Chris. This question period. It is. Did you consider 
reusing that building just for kicks? I think, Chris, I think they said they're going to just demolish the demolition down to the the bottom of those windows. So they're kind of keeping part of that. Yeah, that's that's correct. But the question was, did you consider the whole building? Well, the problem is you have to duck your head when you go in the front door. So that was the problem with that. Yeah. I hear you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Uh, Jeff? No questions. Deb? Um, yes, uh, in the picture of the original swing in pizza building, in behind the flat top building looks like a garage or something. And is that part of the space uh, lot that you're building on? And will it be coming down completely? Because there's nothing looking like it on your uh, uh, planned structure. Yeah, I can go, I can uh, go to that. That is a, a garage and it's in good shape and we're just keeping it as is. Are you going to make it match the look of your 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 new building? Paint? With colors, I mean it's it's a concrete block building, and we've we're just planning on painting it the same color as mm -hmm. the front building. Great, thank you. All right, Lee. No questions. Sam. Oh, I, I'm, this is just sort of I'm curious question. Um, so you have to duck when you come in, so the height is like under six something yeah it, it, it is and it's got an extra it's got like an extra small door and actually i got on the internet and looked at it earlier and there's like basketball players ducked down waiting <laughs> to get the pizza okay. it's, yeah it's just like they added on and they like it had cement higher or something it's just really small all right thank you uh-huh uh, no questions yeah i don't have any questions so let's move on to comments Duncan? Well, I see the I see the need. I you know I'm a uh, old enough to actually I hate to admit it, but I've actually bought pizza from Swing In Pizza, <laughs> and I remember I'm not tall and I practically scraped my head in there. Yeah. My my misgiving is is that. <laughs> and I think this is what generated Chris's question is that now we revere these very modern uh, food establishments, you know, the drive-ins. I mean, these things are wildly popular. We're saving diners from, from junkyards. And this just happens to be a very iconic example of that period building um, that has managed to survive. So it's kind of a landmark in Bloomington. I'm not surprised it hasn't been designated because nobody really probably gives a hoot, but uh, I think maybe that's why Chris was saying, did you consider reusing it? Because it's such an iconic building. I mean, it's a sign all by itself. Uh, I don't know what your use is going to be, but I, I understand the occupancy uh, issues. considerations and issues, and they're, they're very real. But I hate to lose this building. I, you know, uh, I, was, I was sad when, when Swing In pulled out, but... Um, not not because of the food, but just because the building was used by them for, gosh, they must have been in there 35 or 40 years. Um, but anyway, I, I, I mean, all I could offer in, 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 uh, in the interest of, of trying to replicate it would be to, to raise that block wall high enough to, and put the same roof back on it or one very similar to it so that the building still really looks like it was intended to look. The one that you've drawn just sort of looks like, you know, excuse my French, but another fast food joint. And and this building is, you know, has been pretty cool. But I objected when they, you know, when they tore down Ladyman's. So, <laughs> um, but it's definitely an iconic piece of architecture. Well, Thanks, can I uh, Ernesto? No, no comments. Thank you. Can somebody bring me my charging cord, please? My my battery's dying. <laughs> Sorry. Jenny? Jenny? Any comments? I, I need to pull. No, 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 no. no. My computer battery cord. It's, it's plugged no, in. No comments. <laughs> I have one more follow-up. Hang on a second, Chris. 
Sure. So, well, actually, you're next in line, Chris. I would I would echo Duncan and say we're going to give you permission to tear this down, but. If in the middle of the night you wake up and think we could add a couple of layers of block and have this really cool looking weird building, uh, you know, if it comes to you like that, uh, I think we would be very uh, 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 approval oriented and, and excited to help. Thank but I don't you. bet on it. <laughs> but it might happen. There you go. Jeff? No comment. Deb? No, I'm fine, thanks. All right, thank you. Lee? Are you still with us, Lee? Are uh, you plugged in? I muted her. I muted her. I'm sorry. Let me unmute her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lee, where are you? Battery died. Yeah, she's she's not with us anymore. God rest her soul. Sam, any comments, Sam? Oh, I, I, you know, I get that this is an iconic building. I don't think it's a very great example of like, you know, it's kind of crappily thrown together. So I kind of get why they want to take it down, um, but. You know, if they wanted to put something up that was as sort of visually fun as this one, I wouldn't complain either. But uh, I wouldn't have any problems uh, letting this guy go. Thank you. Susan? No, I don't have any comments. You know, I, I tend to agree with uh, Chris on this one. It would be nice uh, if we could, if you could retain uh, kind of the same look that is that it has now. I mean, it really is an iconic place on around 17th Street. Um, so let's move on to um, uh, read the paper. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, do I have their paper? My, do we have it here? I didn't bring it with me. Sam, does anybody have the uh, paper for, dem for, for demolition? My fault. I'll blame it on Connor. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Resolution to stop the motion delay waiting period before the 90 or 100 day period has, has expired, has not expired. Uh, let me move down. Today, regarding the property located in 301, 301 West 7, 17th mm -hmm. Street. Uh, the historic presentation commission got declared that it got notice proposed uh, and after today's discussion sees no need to review the plans any further and waives the rest of the demolition delay waiting period the hpc may later recommend the property for historic designation to county council all right second is that you chris Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Who okay. oh, just joined? Uh, Sam DeSoller. Yes. Susan Dyer. Yes. Jeff Golden. Yes. Deb Hutton. Yes. Lee Sandweiss. Uh, okay. Yes. John Saunders. Yes. Chris Sturbaum. Yes. Motion carries 6-0. All right, great. Thank you. Think about it at 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for your time, everyone. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Okay, do we have any new business? Commissioner comments? No. Any public comments? I, I, I want to just say I think it's interesting and kind of nice how quickly the meeting seemed to go with this sort of like cut people off, put people on. on that <laughs> bringing, bringing that up, Sam, 
um, tonight we did a little bit of different format in, in asking questions and comments. And so I think we'll continue this on for the rest of our meetings, but we're gonna ask our advisors to speak first uh, to help guide us in our decisions. Good idea. Uh, instead of how we've done in the past, and I, I think that's an excellent change. And I wanna thank Eddie uh, for bringing that up to us. Um, and then, I have a comment about that. What's that? I have a comment about that. Yes. I really believe that the voting members who have the authority in these meetings ought to speak first and say what they think and will have their reactions. And as an advisor, I'd rather comment on, on that and, and sort of give a background or provide technical information or, or rule information as a so-called expert advisor than I would weigh in on, on the basic principles of the decision-making. I, I think people should explore those there, as the appointed, as the appointed commissioners, I think I think they should they should go first. And if I don't want to comment on it, I won't. But um, it's sometimes hard to be asked to comment first when you don't really know what you're supposed to comment on, other than the other than the petition itself. Since I can't vote, I don't really want to. I don't want to guide the cons the, the, the discussion that way. I agree with Duncan 100%. I think it's, yes, I think uh, that would be the, the timeline for us to, to in, interject in the conversation. Okay. How does everybody else feel about that? Nobody wants to go first. <laughs> no, I often really appreciate Duncan's point of view and he's often changed my mind. Um, and it helps me, uh, make a decision about which way I vote by, by hearing what he says, but I don't think that would change if he spoke first or last. Just It'll just show that I'm uh, not as smart as I think. <laughs> you could allow Duncan to waive that privilege, and if he wants to speak first, he can pass and speak last if he's, maybe. But I don't, I don't, I think Duncan speaks best for how he should be um, contributing to the commission, and I respect his opinion very much. I'd second that, Chris. Okay. All right. We will uh, we'll go back to our old method. Or just don't have me go first. Okay. <laughs> we can do that, Duncan. But I really I really think that the that the voting members ought to ought to set the discussion. Good point. Thank you. Okay, anything else we need to talk about today? I have one just kind of technical issue. Yeah. I kind of struggle with some pauses every once in a while because we're on mute. And so just a little trick, if you're on mute and you hold down your space bar, you can, it, it takes you out of mute. There's no lag while you're trying to turn on your, your audio. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Zoom expert. We're all going to one of these days. <laughs> okay, do we have any announcements? All right, we are adjourned.